Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. The program coming to you from Beijing. We continue our insights on bilateral ties and trade talks between the world's two largest economies, China and the United States. Thirteenth round of China-U.S. trade talks wrapped up in Washington. U.S. President Donald Trump met with Chinese Vice Premier Liu He and urged both sides to finalize the text of the deal at an early date and move forward with future negotiations. Progress was made in areas including agriculture, intellectual property rights, currency exchange rates, financial services, and expansion of trade and technology transfers. At least that is according to the press release and press readouts. So, do these signals raise confidence for watchers of China-U.S. ties? Earlier, I sat down with Julia Chang Block who was the first Asian American to hold the rank of ambassadorship in the U.S. history. Here's our conversation. <music> Ambassador Block, what a pleasure to see you in Beijing. And what a pleasure to see you in Beijing. <laughs> as long as we can see each other in each other's capitals, it means that there are still very strong ties between China and the United States. But what do you make? Madam Ambassador, of the current stage of trade negotiations. Some say it also reflects the different cultural understanding between the two countries. Well, there's one positive aspect, that we had phase one agreement. Any progress that can be made to find a solution to the trade war, if you will, is a good thing. Mm. However, I must also be candid. You know I am very you are, candid. You are, always. <laughs> I am not a trade expert, but I read the commentaries. I keep up because it's such an important issue. And most of the American commentators say that this phase one agreement, somebody called it a nothing burger. That no fundamental change or progress was made. It just is a reprieve in a way, a uh, timeout, mm. and gives us a chance, more time, for both sides to consider and possibly and hopefully to do better the next time, the next phase. Whether it is inside the so-called uh, a temporary consensus at the negotiation is one thing, but on the other hand, uh, Ambassador Block, I'm sure you have taken notes of what some of the Chinese announcements recently. The opening up of the financial market, some suggest is a step forward, but many wonder whether this incremental step forward is really going to save us from the current negative side of the U.S.-China relations. Talk is good, announcements are good, but we don't see anything in writing. There's no written agreement. Business must have predictability, mm -hmm. certainty, because they have to make their investments. Or if there is uncertainty, then they say, well, maybe we better hedge our bets and we'll take our investment and put it somewhere else mm -hmm. where it's more secure. In this side of the world, Madam Ambassador, you know very well, many of your friends are here. Yes. There are some who believe the nature of this negotiation is about, not about trade. Ah. It could be about the overall logic and the way to interact between China and the United States, even after this trade negotiation. Absolutely. There are also it's others who I believe, agree. okay, Madam Ambassador, that the purpose of this negotiation from the current administration in the U.S. is not about let's find a way out about trade issues, but rather to contain China, to decouple, and to look for an excuse before that happens. I would not call it that exactly, because I think uh, the Chinese must understand there is true frustration in America. I think Americans had expectations. China did benefit greatly 
from integration into the system. Mm. And Americans felt, after all, why doesn't China then move faster on things like reciprocity, mm. like opening up the markets, and so on? So there is real frustration. And I think, uh, again, the Chinese should understand that that frustration just erupted. Otherwise, there would not be consensus. Mm. You know, right now, America is quite polarized Indeed. in every which way. But on China, the Republicans and the Democrats agree. There cannot be that kind of a consensus if there isn't that real frustration. And my concern is that I hope that frustration is not permanent. Mm -hmm. That we have not seen the tipping point. We're nearing it, but that we're not going to go over it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's also similar frustration from this part of the world, yes, yes, as I'm you may know very well, I'm that very well. they believe this is more about the United States not willing to have China as an equal partner. Uh -huh. This is more about the United States not willing to see another country being the runner-up to the U.S., as the U.S. was not happy about Japan decades ago. So they do not see there is any solution out of this, but rather to go by time to see what the time could tell us in terms of solutions. Madam Ambassador. The word runner-up is key. I think you know about the Thucydides gap, or trap. Yeah. That and has know been talked about a lot. A lot. And when a rising power challenges the status quo power, there's always trouble, if not war. But there are also other theories, Madam Ambassador, which suggest even when the two powers could be in the same rank, they could still be able to work together if you ask the academic community. It really depends on which side of the fact you would like to choose and which side of the theories you would like to be on, some say. Well, theoretically, that's very nice. Maybe it has happened, but it has happened more that war ended. We need to be very, very careful. Many in both countries seem to have very little clue as to what it was like to build this relationship from zero to one and how much wisdom does it take from both sides to see the common ground and seek common ground, continue to build common ground, to maintain the common ground until it is being damaged. Mm -hmm. So from one deeply involved in this relationship, help us to understand a little bit more about that. Speaking as an American and from the American point of view, we need to take care of our internal problems. We need to deal with them. We need to sort our own country's problems out. That's the only way we will again be able to deal with China, I think, in a reasonable way. The Chinese will have to seek their own way. Mm and find their own way. But I can speak from the American side. But I think all countries must be balanced. Mm. Madam Ambassador, common sense, in ordinary days, people ignore it mm -hmm. as if, of course, but common sense at time, for example, now, is a rare <laughs> merchandise, shall I say. Mm -hmm. Um, how much do you think people should work on um, in order to maintain this common sense? How to maintain this common sense? Well, we have an election. Because earlier, all your answers is based on common sense. Yes. We have an election coming up. Yes, indeed. Not, not too long now. 2020 election, presidential elections. Uh, well, then, I think America has been through perhaps worse. It's not the first time mm -hmm. that we are so polarized. Well, let's see what happens with our 2020 elections. Mm. People to people exchanges need support from government offices. 
Need you need a visa. Yes, you need a yes, visa, yes, right? Yes. You need to have conferences that sometimes the government has to approve. And now we also heard from the Chinese ambassador some of the academic exchanges between China and the United States have to be reported to the U.S. side by the Chinese side, quote unquote. So how, Madam Ambassador, you will be able to proceed with the next stage trying to create more understanding between the two countries? Foreign NGO has to do in, in, in China. Every one of our activities must go through a process, approval process. And before, you know, you, you could figure out maybe three months. Mm. Then it was six months. Now it's a year. And this year there are added requirements. This is tit for tat. It's not a good thing. It is not a good thing because what happens is that NGOs, non-governmental organizations, get caught in between. We're collateral damage. So how do we do deal with it? We persist. In face of all that, we're still here. And we're still here because we believe that when government-to-government -government relations, what I say is fracture, mm -hmm. then it's people-to-people -people relations. The personal relationships that are established through education and cultural exchanges, mm -hmm. they will endure. On the visa issue, for example, they're reducing the, the time for certain STEM visas, mm -hmm. but they haven't wiped it out completely. I mean, there are small things that we can grab onto and work on it to make sure that nothing worse happens. Are you trying to read the silver lining of the only existing hope between China and the United States when it comes to these bilateral relations, Madam Ambassador? It's not the only silver lining. Ah, almost. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that really reason has to win out. You've been trying very hard over the decades to create a bridge between China and the United States by cultural understanding, by nurturing the young people. Does it hurt when you see the reality now? Hurt is not the word. What is the word? I think it's disappointment on both sides because I think our two countries are the biggest economies in the world today. We have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. If we don't manage our relationship well and wisely, mm -hmm. we only have ourselves to blame, but the world will suffer. It's not just our two countries. And for me, as a Chinese American, I feel an obligation and a responsibility to be the chalia, mm -hmm. to be the bridge, because who better than Chinese Americans to serve in that role. Ambassador Block's personal journey resembles that of many Asian Americans. She was born in China and moved to the U.S. when she was nine years old. And having grown up in San Francisco and obtaining degrees from some of the most prestigious American institutions, Ambassador Block's career includes serving as vice president of corporations to heading grant-making foundations. She is now the president of U.S.-China Educational Trust, a program devoted to promoting American studies in China. Now, let's look back at some of the earliest challenges in Ambassador Block's life. You moved to the United States as a young girl with your family. Mm -hmm do not speak the language, but later managed to get into a very well-respected university and be able to speak out. Tell us more about I'm how Chinese. you... I know, <laughs> I know. But the thing is, how would you be able to overcome that fear factor? Because now we are experiencing one fear factor, from the China wow factor mm -hmm. to the China fear factor. So how do you, Madam Ambassador, looking at your own personal experiences, helping us to understand better about what we are facing right now? Parents. My parents dealt with me like I was the boy. 
I'm the oldest. <laughs> you know how that is in a Chinese family. You have to have a boy, right? Yeah. Well, they didn't have a boy until the third one, and then they stopped. But I still was the oldest. And I always felt from my father, particularly, mm -hmm. that I can do anything I wanted in America as long as I worked hard. And I worked hard. Also, I think it's in the Chinese genes that you respect your parents and that you will be very ashamed if you cannot meet their expectations. My father had extremely high expectations. For example, he went to Harvard. Well, when I was going to college, Harvard did not accept girls. So he said to me, he said, well, you could go to Radcliffe, but we can't afford it. <laughs> so I went to Berkeley, which to me was just as good. He said, you can go to graduate school. Do you see what I mean? And I still remember when I was growing up. You know, if my brother got a C, he didn't say too much. He was disappointed. But if I should get not an A, if I should miss an A, he would say to me, what happened to you? How you grow up, the values you have are intrinsic. And you bid for the chairmanship of the student council or something like that <laughs> in Harvard, and you won. No, no, that was my high school. Okay, high school. Okay, tell me more about that. Huh. Well, I went to a, no, actually, I should start with grammar school. Okay. I went to America, as, as you said, I did not speak English. I went into the fifth grade. By the sixth grade, I had become class president. I, I had learned English in the summers, and my father criticized me. He said, what? You've become totally American. What do you mean, praising yourself, telling people to vote for you? That is not <laughs> Chinese, he goes. I said, why? I said, you told me to become an American. Here I am. I went to an all-city high school in San Francisco. It was at that time predominantly Jewish. There were very few uh, non, I would say, uh, non-white, non-Jewish students there. Now today they call it the Chinese girls school. Interesting. Because you have to test to get in. Mm. So I decided to run for office. It was unheard of for a Chinese, you know, to be running for office. Mm. But then I thought I'd try it, try it. And I won. That's where I won. Also later, the first ambassador with uh, Chinese ancestry. Yes. In the, the US. Asian ancestry. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, how would you be able to do that one after another? Oh, that's a long time after. It's not one after the other. I think it's, I would tell you, America, certainly in my lifetime, has been a land of possibility. I became very American. I decided, okay, go with it. Why not? Some say there are also phenomena in which ethnic Chinese are not necessarily as being respected as it used to be. What do you make of it? You know, Chinese Americans historically have been discriminated against. Indeed. You know about the exclusion laws, Chinese exclusion laws in the 19th century, right? Those laws were not done away with until after World War II. So it's not a new thing for Chinese in America to suffer prejudice. But I think we have tried and we have succeeded in many cases, not all cases, to overcome. Having said that, I think the current issue with respect to Chinese Americans being further discriminated against is due to the imbalance that security, national security, and free exchange of, let's say, research, people-to-people mm -hmm. uh, -people exchange, that has been affected. The balance is not now even. What has happened is the conflict uh, in U.S.-China relations in the political 
strategic and economic arenas have spilled over into people-to-people -people sector. Julia Chan Block, always a pleasure. Thank you so much, ma'am. Can't wait. It's always a pleasure, too. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. And tune in again next time for more insights across China and around the world. Bye for now.